Well, the Bible that we're looking at this morning is the most integrated message system you've ever comprehended. And it's very hard as we're studying Revelation to not keep in mind the fact that Revelation, 22 chapters, has 404 verses. But the 404 verses in Revelation connect with, through quotations and allusions, to over 800 other passages in the Bible. So to understand the throne of God, which is what we're doing, the throne room of the universe, Revelation 4 and 5, it's, it's almost like when you touch a circuit and electrify it, it's amazing where all that circuit goes, where, where that one point is touching. The throne of God in Revelation 4 encompasses a beautiful portrait that, that goes from the front to the back of the Bible. And the only way to understand what we're looking at in Revelation is to allow the Bible to explain the Bible. The reformers called it the analogy of Scripture, that the Bible would explain the Bible. So, to understand Revelation 4, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 6. And as you're turning there to Isaiah, just past the middle of your Bible, you know, hit Psalms, go to the right, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah. Huge book, 66 chapters. Go to the sixth chapter. In one of the most well-known scenes in the Old Testament, we find the throne of God surrounding the call of Isaiah. Now, most times we hear about the call of Isaiah is in the context of a missions conference and those famous words, here am I, Lord, send me. But I would like to cover all the stuff before that, the surrounding scene of what's going on around that. And as you turn to the scene of Isaiah 6, you notice it's representative of what we often see about God's throne. The elements that are here that I'm going to point out, there are three of them, are representative of almost every time God's throne shows up in the scriptures, you find these elements there. And it's amazing that Isaiah brings them together. First of all, God's throne is seen as high. You know, it's exalted, it's high, it's in the mountaintop, it's high and lifted up. We see that here. Secondly, it's holy. God's throne is surrounded, it's permeated by an atmosphere of holiness. Holy means separated. It is set apart. God's throne is set apart like nowhere else in the universe. Now, last week we saw that sometimes God allows to parade in front of him the doomed rebels, the angels, not all of them, but some of them, that, that turned from God in the rebellion of Satan. And they have an appointment of some kind, and that ends in the revelation. God doesn't let them come there anymore. But the, the presence of God, though, is never diminished in its holiness, in its highness. And, and the, the addition, as we see here, of all this smoke and, and earthquake stuff that, that you see in this passage kind of adds the holy high and the smoke and quakes to make... God's throne seem almost distant. And, and that's intentional. That God is to be reverenced. He's not one of the boys. You know, he is different. He is separate. And so that's the Old Testament picture. It's kind of like Moses. When Moses described the quaking, smoke-shrouded thunderings of Mount Sinai. Remember Exodus 19, the, the giving of the Ten Commandments? The purpose of that quaking mountain that began to burn and fire rose like out of a furnace was to remind the people that God was holy. In fact, they put a perimeter out there and said, stay back. And th that was the message, that the unholy are put on notice to be cautious. Ezekiel, now that's going to be the most fascinating, uh, probably next week we'll, we'll get to Ezekiel's description of the, phone, of the throne. It almost sounds like a science fiction movie, better that, because it's true. Uh, there are these creatures that float, and they float uh, in unison, kind of like, you know, the, the Air Force planes that all do their tricks and they all stay together. Well, these things are much better because they are living creatures that are glistening, and the creatures are covered with eyes. But then the neat thing is they have a halo that goes this way, kind of like a hula hoop this way, and a hula hoop that goes this way. And it says that these rings, these halos, constantly are moving with them and they're kind of always inside of this arc of these 
these moving rings. But you know what's neat? The rings themselves are alive and covered with eyes. And it's just all of a sudden we're off the page. I mean, it's like, what are those things? And, and God describes those. But in Ezekiel, there are fiery whirlwinds, these strange creatures surrounded by those dual halos, completely covered with eyes. And we see that God and his throne are a place of, of absolute purity, reverence, holiness, and awe. But as we come to Isaiah... It's God that showed us this holy atmosphere on his throne. He wants us to catch that. This isn't a fluke. It's not like the New Testament, let us boldly you know, come to the throne of grace and mercy. Yes, we boldly come, but only because we're covered. Because of what Christ did on the cross is the only way we can boldly come, Hebrews 4, to the throne of grace and mercy. It's God who showed us the holy atmosphere around his throne and to sense what the presence of the one seated on the throne is like. Isaiah opens the door and writes for us what God showed him. Isaiah chapter 6, if you're there, we're going to read the first seven verses. Let's stand together for the reading of God's word. Remain standing and we'll ask him to bless it. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah 6 and verse 1, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Wow. Verse 2. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. With two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Verse 4. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Verse 6, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. That is an amazing scene. That's almost a representation of what happens the instant that a person bows in just simple faith and calls in the name of the Lord for salvation. This is just showing us the process, this tongue, this coal coming from this altar, which, which portrayed the sacrifice of Christ that was coming, which has happened once and for all on the cross. And that was applied. The, the coal from the sacrifice was applied to Isaiah. And he was purged and forgiven of every sin. And the scriptures say the instant of our salvation, every sin, past, today's, and to the last day of our life. What a picture of what God can do. Let's bow before him in prayer. We pray that this awesome scene of holiness would start penetrating into our minds. This is not some false-filled uh, production of humans that captivate so many people in the movies and the games. This is real. This is where you are, O oh God. This is where we have been invited. And I pray that the holy atmosphere that surrounds your throne and the power that you are would be communicated to us, not as another fact, but how I pray that today that those who will open their hearts to you 
will find this to be a change point in their life to start living in sync with where we're headed and really allowing your throne and your presence and your holiness and your power to be a part of our daily lives. So we, we bow reverently asking for that now. For your glory alone, O Christ, and in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, I just want to reflect with you on Isaiah's visit. Okay, there are three things that I want you to see. Uh, number one, the first lesson as you look at Isaiah chapter 6, God is absolutely holy and his holiness is demonstrated because he's surrounded by flaming holy angels, quakes, and smoke. Now, this isn't like, you know, I love it. You know, I get invited to these college things and, and usually they're around Christmas and New Year's and they have these big retreats. You know, they invite me. In fact, the reason, they told me, they're very honest. They said, we brought you because you are so old, no one else still does this. And I said, what? They said, the kids love it. They said, you don't have any clips, no video clips, no snazzy wazzy, you know, all the stuff, you know. They said, you just come out with a Bible. And it's almost like no one even has one of those anymore. You know, they, it's all digital and they use their iPhone so that they don't miss anything online. And and they said, so you come out with that, that old book and you talk from it. And they said, that's, we, that's what we want you to do. Well, you know what I have to wait for? I forget every year to bring my earplugs. I mean, you talk about shaking, vibrating. Very often my pen that I have right here is just going... I mean, those bases, I don't even know where they are. And smoke. I mean, it's just... It's just unbelievable what they go through. Uh, that is not what this is like. That is all, you know, all that is, I don't know what they make the smoke out of and all the lights and the huge. This is real. And this is what God wants us to see. That in his holiness, he is surrounded by flaming. Seraph means burning ones. Now, most of us have never seen a burning creature. Well, you have in the summer. If you have one of those bug light things, you know, with the purple light in the middle and the, the electrified things, you can see for just a, a burning creature, but it's gone. These things keep burning, and they just are flaming beings, these seraphim, plural. That's more than one. A seraph, seraphim is more than one. They are flaming, but they're surrounding. When they speak, they cause quakes. They cause the whole place to shake, and there's all this smoke. Well, I want you just to notice the holy atmosphere of heaven surrounding God's throne. There are three things that Isaiah tells us about God's holiness. Number one, it's connected to the smoke. In fact, our God, Hebrews says, is a consuming fire. And whenever you have a consuming fire, smoke is a byproduct. And so there is this, this picture in the Bible every time the infinite God from this throne gets near humans... As he enters the atmosphere, so to speak, as, his, as he comes from the spiritual dimension into ours, this consuming fire comes with him, and it seems to consume everything around it. In fact, when, when God came down to meet with Abraham in Genesis 15 to make his covenant, smoke was rising like from a furnace as, as this fire came. You didn't see God. You don't see somebody walking around with white hair. You see this flaming, consuming fire with smoke rising out of it. When he came down to talk to Moses on the top of Mount Sinai, it says that the entire mountain was enveloped in smoke and it began to look like a updraft from a furnace. The smoke just, just was going fast upward. This is how God, our consuming fire, comes with this smoke. Secondly, look at verse 4. When, when, the, when they mention that God is holy in verse 3, in verse 4, it says the posts of the door were shaken. In other words, the, the whole structure, the whole uh, building materials were quaking. And again, when God comes down, there's this, it's almost like that the natural world cannot bear to just idly sit and, and allow God 
the creator. It's, see, the, the universe knows the creator. And so it begins to quake. Quakes here. Mount Sinai, it says, was quaking so much it scared the people to death. And, and they fled. And it says the same in Revelation as God comes down in his wrath. It says that the earth is, is convulsed with earthquakes like, I mean, nothing. I mean, it's going to be like a 20 on the Richter scale, not an 8 or a 9. It says every island in the oceans sinks below the water. Every island. Every island. I mean, that's, that's quite a quake. But thirdly, it's not just the smoke and the quaking. Look at verse 2, and this is what I want to spend some time on. Notice these amazing creatures that are surrounding God. In Isaiah 6, 2, we meet some of God's creations that we only see here. Now, I think uh, that the seraphim are in Revelation, they're just not named, because we see angels that are doing the same thing. They're ferrying burning coals from the altar before the throne, and they're, they're dispensing them. And it seems like the flaming ones deal with the coals that come from the altar representing the sacrifice of Christ. But they're only named here. They're called seraphim, which means the burning ones. And they seem to be a part of the throne team that are always associated with carrying out God's plans, especially those attached to the sacrifice of Christ. When Isaiah sees how holy God truly is, his first response, look what he does in verse 5. When, when, when he sees the, the smoke, when he sees the quaking, when he sees these flaming creatures and, and looks up and sees that, that train of God's robe just filling the temple and then sees the throne, boom, in verse 5, woe is me. For I am undone. Undone is an interesting word. It means dissolving. He just felt in the presence of the holy God, he just felt himself disintegrating. Why? Because he knew how unholy he was. It's just like in Genesis 15, Abraham, it says, had a horror. It says that, that the horror came over him because it just scared him to be so close to someone so great and so separate and so powerful and so holy. In fact, in the New Testament, it's fascinating, the same thing occurs. When Peter saw the deity of Christ displayed, remember Peter, Luke 5, uh, the first seven verses, Peter's doing his thing, you know, and fishing and didn't get any fish, and Jesus comes to the shore. This is not John 21, this is an earlier one. This is actually a turning point in Peter's life. And Jesus calls from the shore and says, hey, Peter, put your, put your nets, plural, in Greek, on the other side, Peter says, I've fished all night. There aren't any fish here. But, okay, for you, I'll throw one. And the Greek says he put one in, one net, singular. As the net hit the water, a solid mass of fish filled it, and it started tearing it open. You know what? That's when Peter kind of forgot about fishing. And it says, he fell right on his face, and he says, please leave. I am so sinful you are God. You see, there's this, this reaction to what God does. And, and we see this reflected in, in these creatures. But here's the big picture. God is absolutely holy. That's the first lesson. And the personal application of that lesson is we need to be like Peter. We need to be like Job we saw last week. We need to be like Isaiah that we're looking at right here in chapter 6. There was a response. If there's true worship, there is a response. And it's always the same. That's why I fear about a lot of worship nowadays. A lot of worship is entertainment. Now, I'm going to cover that later. Biblical worship causes people to be dissolved in their human pride and strength and self-sufficiency. And the only thing that they can think of is just falling humbly before God. Now, we're supposed to be doing that all the time. Just as Isaiah needed to be purged, so must we. God has explained to us what he desires. He wants us to bow daily in reverence to him. He wants us to seek to being, be kept clean. You all know one of the best known verses. If we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to what? Cleanse us. Now, it's interesting. The, the way the Lord designed that verse, if we 
present active indicative is the, the form of the Greek word. If we are constantly characterized by confessing our sins, do you know what an evidence of salvation is? An awareness of sin and a hatred of sin and saying the same thing about my sin that God says. That's an evidence of salvation. If you meet someone that says sin, no, no, not me. I live a pretty good life, you know. Up and up, pretty good, yeah. No, Christians are dissolved by the awareness of how holy our God is and how unholy we are. In fact, when you see someone that, that mourns over their sin, you see a very great representation of what delights God. In fact, when I meet people that are just so worried that they've committed the unpardonable sin, I'm more convinced those people are Christians. Why? Because they are so aware of how holy God is and how unholy they are. But what the Lord says, 1 John 1, 9, it's our constant responsibility to be confessing our sins so that Christ can cleanse us from our unrighteousness. We're already forgiven. There was a once and for all Hebrews 10, 12 sacrifice. Jesus doesn't just keep forgiving. See, we, we need to understand the theology of forgiveness is God only forgives once. We confess constantly. He already has forgiven us. Now, we have to constantly be forgiving others. And they have to be forgiving us. God forgives once. And the essence of salvation is, if you've ever been forgiven of any sin, you also have been forgiven of all sins. And if you have any sin that's not forgiven, you don't have any that are forgiven. Because God does not give it out by pieces. He's not saying, oh, okay, I'll cover that one. I'm not sure about those two. This one I'll do. He doesn't cherry pick. He forgives Hebrews 10, 12, by one sacrifice, once and for all, he has forgiven us through the work of Christ on the cross. But what are we supposed to do? We're each needing constant cleansing. Now, look at verse 2, because I want to show you another point. Second point, not only is God absolutely holy, God is absolutely all-powerful over everything that is anywhere. And I want to illustrate this from verse 2, because in verse 2, we bump into these flaming ones. And, and most of us spend far too little time thinking about what it says here. I mean, this is a creature that exceeds anything we understand. Now, in movies, you know, we can have flaming people and all kinds of cartoon things, but that's not real. We all know that's not real. This is real. This creature in verse 2, this seraph, exceeds anything that we know is possible in this universe, for a living creature to live in burning flame, we don't know anything about that. It, it just is beyond what we're able to do. And God shows us his absolute all power over everything by the reflection of the creatures he made to surround him. Now remember, just put this in your mind, God on the throne is greater than the sum of everything he has made. He made all this stuff. So God is greater than any individual part of his creation. Whatever you think is big, the Grand Canyon, the moon, the stars, the galaxies, subatomic physics, he is greater than any single part. He's greater than the totality of all of his creation. And he made everything, including these creatures. Each of the angels we read about in God's word have a power that exceeds anything we can understand. There's so much we don't know about what else is out there in the universe besides us humans, but what we do know is overwhelming if you think about it. Let's just work with what we do know instead of the fringes that we don't know. We are surrounded at all times by these, like this one in verse 2, and many other supernatural creatures, each one of them dwarf us in every way. I mean, any angel, the least angel, is greater than any human being. And just makes the human being seem like an amoeba compared to what that angel is in its being, in its power. Just whether it's a good or a bad angel, just that angel. And there are billions of them. And the one that made all of them is greater than all of them together. But these are powerful, mobile, intelligent creatures. They're beyond anything we can comprehend. As far as we know, angelic creatures are indestructible. They can't be killed or destroyed. They can be penned up. They're indestructible. They travel the universe effortlessly with no spaceships. 
I mean, oh boy, you know, they're redoing the Star Wars thing. I remember watching it in London in the 70s. You know, the premiere, it was a big deal. I wanted to go see Star Wars. And, and, and you know, those big ships, you know, makes noises. We've got to surround ourselves with a bubble of Earth to go anywhere. These creatures can be out near absolute zero. Probably they can do absolute zero uh, because they're spiritual and they're not made of matter. Uh, they can be in intense heat. They can be in intense cold. They can be in a vacuum. They can be in water. They can be anywhere. In fact, they exist down in the, in the parts of the earth that no one knows anything about but God. Remember, God says there's a whole bunch of these things that are here. They're in this prison that the entrance to it is over in the Middle East and they're going to be let out during the tribulation, Revelation 9. These creatures are amazing. But God on the throne is the originator. He is the creator of angels. God spoke. All he did is say something. And billions of these angels appeared from nothing. So God is greater than anything he created and greater than the totality, the sum of all that he created. And that's who's on the throne. That's all holy and all powerful. Yet those angels he made from nothing have powers that exceed anything we can comprehend. By the way, there are two types of angels revealed by God. We'll do a little angelology. The good angels and the rebel angels. God's very clear. There's two kinds, good and rebels. So it's clear from the division of the angels that God doesn't tolerate rebellion at all. There are many orders within the two kinds. The, I'm not talking about mythology here. The Bible, God, tells us of orders, that's levels, of created beings within the angelic ranks. Among the good, there are at least five types of good angels the Bible talks about. Number one are the archangels. The only one that's specifically called that is Michael, but Gabriel seems to be in league with him. And so they're the archangels. Uh, Michael is the head of all the armies of God, so he has the largest army in the world. Uh, in the universe. Um, then there are these flames. They're called the flames. It says that there are seven flames that always stand around the throne of God. In fact, the throne of God is round, and there are these seven. If you read about them in Revelation 4, you also read about them in Revelation 1. You find them in the Gospels. You even find them clearly described in the Old Testament book of Zechariah. And it says that these are the angels that, that appear to be like flames of fire that always face God. They're always, there's seven of them, and they're standing equidistantly around his throne, and their, their faces are always toward him, and he dispatches them to do things. They're, they're called the flames. Michael and Gabriel might be just two. The Jews, of course, have named all seven, but, you know, Raphael, and da, 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 they have names for all of them, but the Bible doesn't, so we'll stick with the Bible. Thirdly, there, there's the guardian. Uh, he was the anointed or covering cherub. His name was Lucifer. Probably God's replaced him. I don't know. But there was a position of the good angels called this guardian or this covering or this anointed cherub. And that is in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. And he, the, the morning star, the light-bearing one, he was the one that if you've ever seen a photographer that has kind of like a, a white umbrella thing and it's hooked to a flash pack and the flash pack goes into the umbrella and the umbrella parabolically reflects and kind of like magnifies the light going out, that's what this guardian did for the glory of God. As God's glory came from the throne, Ezekiel says that he is the one that, that was above God like with his wings and for like a parabolic reflector saying, may the glory of God fill the universe. But then he kind of got intoxicated by it in pride and fell. Then, fourthly, the rest of the people that, that Lucifer used to be, the cherubim, we don't know how many of them there are, but they're always around God's throne and in other places. These are the ones that guarded the tree of life in Genesis 4. The cherubim are fascinating. They're living creatures. They're covered with eyes. We know what the devil looked like. He had all these wings and he's covered with eyes and he didn't wear red tights or have a pointy tail. He's just a cherub. Then there are angels. There are billions of them, it seems. And they're all through the scriptures and they're very powerful. Those are the good ones. Now remember, again, these angels created by God have power that exceeds our comprehension. Think about that. Now, for the good ones, 
it's hard to tell what their power is because God sends them to do stuff and, and it's interchangeable in the Bible whether they're doing it or God's doing it and they're just watching, you know? And so we don't really have a lot of mileage in the scriptures about what exactly the good angels can do. Now, they can touch people and they are strengthened. You know, they can guard. They, there are all kinds of things they do. But where it gets really eerie is when we look at the power of the other side of the angel spectrum. There are several orders of bad or unholy or rebel angels. And what they can do begins to test the limits of our minds. Now, we won't go to the fringe in the gray area, you know, out in the distant where we can't see it. We'll just stick with what the Bible says in black and white clearly. Number one, there are seven orders of angels. The first one is the shining one. That's Lucifer, as Satan is called in Isaiah 14, 12. He's the ruler of this world, John 12, 31. Paul tells us in, a, in, in the book of Ephesians that he's the God of this world. He, John says in John, 1 John 5 that the whole world is in his arms. So we're talking about the greatest of all God's created beings is Lucifer, Satan, the devil. And he is the fallen, formerly highest and most powerful of all the angels. We bump into him from Genesis 3 to chapter 20 of Revelation. He just permeates the Bible as the shining one, the angel of light that deceives people. Remember where Satan is busy is in religion, not in the bar, not in the gay bathhouse. Satan is busy in the church. He's an angel of light. Why do you think all these books always have all these Mormons and Hindus and, and Confucians and Muslims all going to a place where this angel of light hugs them? Who do you think that is? It's not Jesus. Christ, the Lord. It's the angel of light, Lucifer. He's a deceiver. And what you deceive is you become a counterfeit of the truth. So God is not into all that wicked stuff, so Lucifer is counterfeiting the good stuff. And without knowing the Bible, many people... I mean, I remember when I was in high school at Hazlitt, they had us read one of the most popular demon-written books in the world. In the 70s, it was called Jonathan Livingston Seagull. Some of you that are as old as me probably read it. It's a real upbeat book about a seagull. You know what it was about? It, it's, it's the whole Eastern reincarnational lie of the devil. And it was written through automatic writing. If you know anything about Bach that wrote it, he put a pen between his hands, like this, and surrendered to the demons, and he became a printer. And, the, and there are many books like that. And there are many articles in, in magazines that come from automatic demon energized writing and only by knowing the truth can you detect the error the third or the second of these angelic creatures is the destroyer this is a specific named angel that's also referred to as the one that's sent from the lord that brings death in fact the destroyer uh, who's also known as apollyon and abaddon hebrew abaddon greek apollyon was the one who slew all the firstborn in Egypt before Israel left in Exodus 12, 23. It's differentiated. It says the Lord killed him, but then it says the destroyer killed him. You see, the Lord didn't run around and kill all those babies. The Lord dispatched, and we know from Revelation, that this is one of those really bad angels that God keeps locked up. Probably if he let him loose, he'd kill everybody. And so God just allows him to kill a little group at a time. And this one, after he killed all the firstborn of the Egyptians in, in Exodus 12, 23, later he kills 70,000 men just like that all over Israel because of David's census in 2 Samuel 24. He also was dispatched by God in response to the prayer of Isaiah and Hezekiah, and he's the one that destroyed the entire Assyrian army in 2 Chronicles 32. One angel killed 185,000 soldiers in their sleep without a peep. Dead very strong creature. Thirdly, his soldiers, they're the horrible monsters under him, under Abaddon. These are the horrific creatures that are contained in this pit that's somewhere in the Middle East, down deep in the earth, awaiting deployment into warfare during the tribulation. Revelation 9, 1 through 11 contains the chilling description of them. 
When they get out, you know, I don't know if you read the news, but there are these very, very mega wealthy people building their little bunkers for the end of the world. And I mean, they have bored them in Sweden's mountains and they have enough seeds that they can replant the earth themselves. And they're down all over the place. Silicon Valley has a lot of them. They put these things down. They have air conditioning and generators and tanks and diesel and, you know, everything, just a paradise down there. And they think that steel and concrete can stop these things. See, these are spirit beings that can inflict physical effects. Remember Job was smitten with boils by a spirit being. And they have the poison of scorpions, but those are awful things. Then there are just number four, the demons. They're they're called fallen angels. We see them, they're the bulk of the one-third of the heavenly hosts that rebelled with Satan, and and they're described in Revelation 12.4. We find demons everywhere. From the lying spirit that got Ahab to go into battle and be killed to the constant demon pests that Jesus had to deal with in the Gospels. By the way, demon is one of many words that go directly from Greek into English without being translated. They're transliterated. In other words, they put English letters that correspond with the Greek letters. And, And in Greek, the word is daimon. And in English, it's demon. So you can see it's just a correspondence. But what the word means is intelligence. A demon is a supernaturally intelligent being, and there are billions of them. And they're not stopped by walls or locks or steel. Then, fifthly, there's some really bad ones, if you didn't think those were bad. These, the Lord has chained. They're called the doomed angels. They're described as evil angels chained by God and imprisoned in a place 1 Peter calls it in 1 Peter 3.19, 3, a prison. But Peter goes on to say in 2 Peter 2.4 that they're actually literally in a place called Tartarus. Now, I had a call this week. Someone was watching YouTube. You know, there's this whole generation of people that live on YouTube, you know, and they were watching the trailers. They watch these trailers of movies, you know, because you just can't wait for the movie. You've got to watch the trailer, you know, and comment on the trailer. And they said, they said, um, I was watching a trailer of a movie, probably shouldn't have been watching it, but uh, um, it's about Titans. And he says, I think that's in the Bible, isn't it? You know? And, and I said, yeah. I said, but you'd learn a lot more about it in the Bible than on YouTube. I says, why don't we switch our, our vehicle, you know, here? And, and I explained to him, but yeah, Tartarus is where these, these creatures are imprisoned that are around from the time before the flood, and they're awaiting final judgment. In fact, Jude talks about them, and he says that these creatures are so malignant, and they are so vile and wicked that they got the entire human race to follow them, except for eight people everybody else they got. And you know the eight. Mr. and Mrs. Noah and their three sons and their wives. Everyone else followed him. Of course, Enoch went ahead. So there were nine that didn't succumb. And God took them, and it says in Jude that he has put them in everlasting chains under darkness, and they will never get out until the final judgment. And then they'll be cast with Satan into the lake of fire. So these are the doomed angels. Then, sixthly, these are, and we know even less about these. I'm going in the order we know about them. These are the nation princes. Daniel bumped into them in Daniel 10, verses 13 and 20. And there's only two of them named. The prince of Persia, the prince of Greece. Now let me ask you a question. Is Persia, Iran in the news? I mean, they're in the news every day. I have an aggregator with Google. I mean, it's just too much. I can't even read it. I erase most of them. Iran is just plastered in the news. I mean, they're enriching this, and they're enriching more, and they're, now they have, they've just done the Shihab 12, you know, and it's just blah, 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 blah. And do you think that the millions, what are there, 70 million Iranians? I don't know. Do you think that they all just sit around and dream at night about murdering Jews? No. What is inciting the nation of Iran to recklessly go in the face of the God of the universe and say, we are going to, by their own words, published, we are going to exterminate the Jews. Now, God has already said, no one can exterminate the Jews, and the Jews are going to be around because they're my evangelists for the tribulation, and they're the ones that are going to populate the millennium. And so they are going to exist to the end. So if you want to make sure you're around, stay around Jews because they make it to the end. What would make 
Iran fly in the face of God and, and do everything. I mean, their people are starving and they're building nuclear enrichment facilities and missiles. What's doing that? In, in Daniel 10, it says there's a prince of Persia. He's one of these, my theory is, it doesn't say this in the Bible, but I bet those seven angels that face the throne of God, some of those defected too. And those are very powerful angels. Michael and Gabriel are just two of them. But those that always faced God, some of them probably went, and they're probably these prince of Persia, prince of Greece. They, they are behind nations that produce national events that, that are no reason humans should act that way without being incited. And then, seventhly, we know least about them. Paul describes what are probably even some more orders of demon fallen angels in, in Ephesians 6.12. And it says there are principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this age, and spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So there's more of them out there. But just for a moment, think of that destroyer I mentioned. Think of the power that just one angel under God's direct control could find every firstborn in the dark. Can you imagine the power of these angels? An army of special forces with the entire harnessed computing energy of the whole world could not isolate out of a population instantly all the firstborn animals and humans. Come on, in the dark? in an agrarian where they're spread all over, living in wherever they lived, in their little huts. But on one night, while they were all sleeping, this destroyer found the firstborn, only the firstborn, didn't... I mean, we would nuke them, you know, just do them all. Boom, 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 boom. Every house, every stable. The, nothing we know compares to the the power this angel has. So, you know what the good news is? God on the throne is greater than any individual one of these created beings, and he is far greater than the collection of all of them put together. And so our God, the big picture is God is absolutely powerful, and the personal application is we should not fear. Instead, we are supposed to resist. Do you know what James tells us? James says, resist the devil. He's the top he is the boss to the destroyer and to all those that are in Tartarus and to everybody else that's on his team. He is greater than all of them. And you know what the Bible says? James 4, 8, resist the devil and he will what? Flee. Wow. All we have to do is resist him and be strong in the Lord. And we have to remind ourselves that the battle is already won. Christ has already triumphed. We're more than conquerors through Christ. And the sword of God's spirit is the word. And we need to believe it. We need to memorize it. We need to have it ready. And we need to use it. So, God on the throne is absolutely holy. And he's absolutely powerful. But in the Old Testament and in Revelation, he kind of looks a little distant. Real quickly, I want to close. Go to the New Testament, book of Matthew, and I want to introduce you to the one on the throne through the eyes of the one that knows him better. In fact, the scriptures tell us that one came to reveal the Father to us. Because the one on the throne, in Matthew 5 and verse 16, the one on the throne of heaven is God the Father. Jesus says in verse 16, let your light so shine before men, Matthew 5, 16, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So God is in heaven but look down at verse 34. Jesus said in, in Matthew 5, 34, But I say to you, don't swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is what? God's throne. You see, the one on the throne of heaven is God the Father. So Jesus says, you want to know what God the Father's like? Look at verse 45. He's kind. James, or, uh, Matthew 5, 45 that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He makes the sun rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. That's why he's God. I mean, I wouldn't let it rain on the, the unjust. I would let their lawns die, you know? I wouldn't let the sun shine. Let them be in the dark. They live like the dark. Let them be in the dark. God is kind. Now, in the tribulation, he's not kind. In the, the millennium, he's not kind. He doesn't rain on the bad ones. They, they have to either shape up or they die. But now he's kind. Uh, look at verse 48. He's perfect. Be perfect. Your Father in heaven is perfect. The one on the throne is perfect. You know, we have such imperfections. You know, I had a disaster this week. Did you know that my iMac had a blip, had a problem? 
I thought they weren't supposed to have problems. I thought only PCs had problems. And, and it was terrible. But it was a reminder. Everything touched with sin, humanity in this world, is imperfect. God is perfect. Our Father on the throne is perfect. Look at chapter 6, verse 1. Our Father on the throne gives rewards. Uh, take heed that you don't do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them, otherwise you'll have no reward. God is the reward from our Father in heaven, verse 1 says. God gives rewards. What does he give rewards for? Well, we're going to look at that tonight. He gives rewards because every one of us have absolute latitude to choose what we want to do. We go through life with just a series of choices. God does not force us to obey him. If he did, we would be a lot different. Every one of us here, I, I would be out of a job. I wouldn't have to tell you to read the Bible and pray and go out and we wouldn't have an evangelism department. We would all do it all. Because if he forced us, we'd do everything he said we're supposed to do. It's a choice. We're going to examine that tonight. But wow, he's the one that rewards those that do what he asked them to do. Look at verse 4, the end. It says, your father who sees in secret... Matthew 6, 4, God sees everything. And then it says, verse 6, pray to your father who is in the secret place. Your father sees in secret. He'll reward you openly at the end of verse 6. God on the throne of heaven sees everything, hears every prayer, and is everywhere present. Wow. Aren't you glad you know him? With all those things out there? We don't even know what all's out there, but the ones we know about are awful. And yet, the absolutely holy, quaking, surrounded by burning angels, all-powerful, greater than the sum of the universe, says, I'm your father. And I want you to talk to me, and I hear you. And, and, and look what it says in verse 8. He knows our needs. Don't be like them. Your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. Prayer is not informing God. Prayer is the means God used. He said, I will not work inside of you and I will not work through you unless you approach me in prayer. And you can cut it down. You don't need to inform me. What you ask is to, for God to conform me to his plans because God will always accomplish his purpose and there is no limit to what he'll do for us and through us if we just yield instead of doing it our own way. Keep looking. Look at verse 9. He says, direct your prayers to me. After this manner, therefore pray to the all-holy, all-powerful one that's your father on the throne. Verse 9. Look at verse 14. He forgives sins. Nobody else can. If you forgive men trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. He doesn't forgive the unforgiving. And that's why a lot of Christians are tormented, because they have been freely forgiven by Christ, and they won't forgive others. And God doesn't force them but he robs them and, and takes away from them the joy of salvation. And they become tormented because of their unforgiving heart. Real quickly, look at verse 26. Our Father on the throne of heaven cares deeply for us. Verse 26, look at the birds. They don't sow or reap, but your Father in heaven feeds them. Are you not much more value than they, Jesus said, don't you think? Jesus didn't die for birds. Or for any other animal, he died for you. And we're valuable because he paid so much for us. Verse 30, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today, today is and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, won't he clothe you? Verse 32, after all these things the Gentiles seek, your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. God cares deeply for us. Look at verse 33. He's the one we're supposed to seek. It says, seek first the kingdom of God, that God is king. The one on the throne, the one that's all powerful and holy. Seek him first over everything else. By the way, he sees what we do in secret. And he knows our thoughts and he knows everything. He knows if we're doing that. He doesn't force us. Well, how should we approach the one on the throne? He's kind, so we don't have to fear. He's perfect. He doesn't need any improvements on his job as father. He gives rewards. And he wants to pour out his blessings on us. He sees everything, hears our prayers. He's everywhere present. He knows our needs. He knows even before we ask, but he chooses prayer is the means and method he uses to transform us. He wants us to pray to him. He forgives our sins in spite of the fact he knows how much we've sinned and how much we continue to sin. And he still forgives us endlessly. 
and he deeply cares for us. He's neither distant nor detached, and he's the same one that's sitting on the throne in Revelation 4. And he says, I want you to know me, absolutely holy, absolutely greater than the sum of everything I've made. I'm all-powerful above everything there is. But I want to relate to you as Father. And that's why we've gathered in his name today. Let's stand for a word of prayer. As we stand, a uh, little reminder, if you need to talk to a person, now the Lord is here. He hears our prayer in secret. But if you need the, the, the delight of a human praying with you and, and seeing that embodiment of God's love in a person, at the end of the service, at every service, we always have godly men and women. They'll be here. Number two, if you're interested in getting more deeply associated with the ministries here, we have the reception. And if you've ever wondered about what choices God gives us and what ones he doesn't, and is it all case or us or us is going to happen? Or is there latitude? Are we really given the freedom? That's, that's what we're going to start with tonight and, and uh, at the Q&A. So remember those three things. Let's bow together in prayer. Father in heaven, may our lives hallow your name. May we reverence you enough to allow your kingdom to rule in the secret parts of our lives. And may we realize that you are kind and deeply care for us and we're so glad we know you because there's such awful stuff out there. But yet even the greatest flees when by your spirit through your word we resist. May you teach us what that means. And may we triumph in Christ in whose name we pray. And all of God's people said... Amen. God bless you as you go.